introducing Don Farmer um, and Maria Del Rio uh, Chanona, who have written a very interesting paper, Supply and Demand Shocks in the COVID-19 Pandemic, uh, for the latest issue, which is a special feature uh, issue uh, on the pandemic of Oxrep, uh, edited by, amongst others, Cameron Hepburn. Uh, and they'll be talking about that paper and also some of the associated work uh, that they are doing that, that doesn't um, come into uh, the journal issue. So this is a, a double treat for us. We get the journal paper plus more. Um, and no doubt they're, they're thinking since they did that. Uh, I recruited Don Farmer to Oxford um, some time back. I can't remember when it was, Don. Uh, um, uh, eight years ago. Eight years ago. Um, to run the complexity economics group uh, in the Oxford Martin School from Santa Fe. Uh, he's a leading world thinker on complexity economics. Um, he really is not only a top economist, but has been uh, in physics and maths as well, uh, and uh, amongst the leading people in the world on agent-based modeling and breakthroughs in other areas of economics. Someone who's managed to combine um, interdisciplinary thinking from multiple perspectives into economics to make real breakthroughs in economists' understanding of the world uh, and to show us how tools uh, that he and others have developed can be useful and no doubt we'll be seeing that uh, in the presentation today. He's also um, dabbled in other areas including wearable technology and was a founder of the prediction company uh, which was sold to uh, UBS in 2006. So Don, delighted to to be um, with you on this. And he'll be joined by Maria Del Rio Chirona, who's a doctoral student at INET, uh, was uh, from Mexico, Universidad Nacional Autónoma of Mexico, where she did her BS uh, before starting her PhD. And she's been focusing on data-driven network models of labor markets. So they'll talk for about um, half an hour or so. We'll have a short conversation and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So I encourage people to post their questions in the ask a question tab, which is, should be on the bottom right uh, of your screens. So delighted that you've all joined. And let me hand over to um, Maria and Don. Okay, so I will uh, start off and introduce the talk and then I'm going to make a handoff to Maria. I don't think I have to convince anybody that COVID, the COVID pandemic is having a profound economic effect on the world. Uh, what we're gonna present here is our, the model we've made for it. And so you'll get to see how it was done. Um, the COVID pandemic is actually unusual from an economic point of view in several respects. The first one is that ironically, it's actually the case where things in a sense work conceptually the way they should in economics. That is, most big economic events, in my opinion, are endogenous. They come from within the economy itself. The 2008 crisis would be a good example. The Great Depression would be another good example. These things, business cycles are, in my opinion, another example. But that's not the way economists normally look at them. The way economists normally look at them is they're exogenous events. They're what they call shocks that hit the economy from outside the economy somewhere. And then the economy responds to those outside events. The COVID pandemic, in my view, is the rare case where that point of view is the correct way to look at things. And so you'll see that in the way our model is structured here. We begin by trying to understand what those shocks are. And a big challenge in our case was to actually predict the shocks before we knew what they were. Normally in economic models, the shocks hit and then you measure them and then you look at how the economy responds. Our effort's unusual and we actually predicted the shocks before they occurred. And then once they occur, you have to look at how the economy responds to it. Now, the pandemic is also unusual in other respects. First of all, the shocks are big. This is a profound event in economic history. The shocks are big and they're deep, but they're precise. So they don't hit everything. Um, they hit the things you see happening. Restaurants, for example. Restaurants are more or less gone. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, so some sectors get hit profoundly. Other sectors don't get directly hit at all. And another way in which this is unique is that everything happened really fast. 
you'll see when Maria talks about her model, in a matter of a month, there were profound effects on the economy. Um, and so you really have to think at a fairly rapid time frame. And the model that Maria will discuss, we both forecast the shocks. And then we, we had to make a whole new kind of economic model in which we look at things as a function of time, in which we're able to deal with really large shocks. We had to think about the means of production. How would the economy as a whole be affected by the effect of shocks in some sectors on the production of other sectors? Um, so we had to think about things like inventories. Uh, so we had to do quite a lot of bespoke work to build the model that Maria is about to present to you. I think it's an important step in a new direction of complexity economic models that simulate the economy from the bottom up and that take what happens in the economy as an emergent phenomenon of these lower level uh, events. So on that, I'm gonna hand things over to Maria and let her present the model that we made and then we can come back. I can maybe participate more in the question period. Over to you, Maria. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, I'm just sharing screen. Hopefully um, you'll be able to see my screen. Is that good? Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of her work. Uh, and it's on supply and demand shocks and the work we did later, and this has all been done at INET. So I'd like to start by asking who's the most vulnerable in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, now, if, if you've been you know, following the news, you'd say it's probably the elderly uh, people with pre-existing conditions or such, such as asthma and diabetes. However, we think this is only part of the question uh, because uh, there's also people that are vulnerable because of the nature of their work or the activities they do every day. So we're talking about doctors that are more exposed to the virus and people that are exposed to the virus uh, due to close proximity or because they cannot work uh, because uh, their sector has been locked down and then their income is compromised. So we try to see this as an early stage economic diagnostic to identify the vulnerable population. Uh, so to do this, we ask, uh, how is the economy affected? Uh, and on the supply side, we see uh, that uh, some industries cannot work because they're not considered essential, so pubs and restaurants, uh, but may, and some parts of manufacturing that were closed. And then if, if people cannot work remotely, they just cannot work at all. On the demand side, uh, we see that some industries uh, weren't closed, uh, but uh, people changed their consumption preference. And so, for example, we see transport that was considered essential, but people uh, didn't use transport as much. So we split this in uh, demand and supply. Uh, and on the supply side, as we said, we wanted to calculate everything with data pre the pandemic. So we looked at, for the US, how uh, the, the composition between industries and occupations, so which industries employ workers for which occupations. We also had uh, data from the, the Italian government released data on their essential industries. So we could see which industries were going to be closed or not due to the pandemic. On the occupation side, we have data on the work activities they do. And then we can label the work activities as can be done remotely or not. And we can come up with a remote labor index. And in this way, we can say uh, which industries can work and which occupations can work. Basically, you can work if your industry is considered essential or you can work from home. And if those things don't happen, you just cannot work or cannot produce. Uh, so just to take a look at the remote labor index, uh, here on the horizontal axis, we have a remote labor index. If it's one, it means you can do everything from home. Zero means you can't do anything. Uh, and we see education has a high remote labor index, as we expect, and construction a low uh, labor index. And this is from uh, the occupation side. But we have this duality between occupations and industries. So from the industry side, we have uh, finance and insurance have a high remote labor index, as you'd expect. Agriculture, forestry, and fishing have a low uh, remote labor index. Okay, and now we're gonna couple this with uh, essentialness, right? So we also have this data on how, which industries are essential. And so in, in this plot, you have the remote labor index on the horizontal axis and the fraction of employed in essential industries. And we have different occupations here. 
And the people we're worried about are those that uh, are not in essential industries, so they're industry closed, and also they cannot work remotely. So we're looking at the bottom left quartile, and for example, roofers, rock splitter, dishwashers, these are the people that can't work remotely. Okay, and then we put this together, and we say, well, around how many people cannot work? So we have the, those charts of the people that are in non-essential jobs and people that cannot work remotely. And in conjunction, it's around 19% of the US population, what we uh, predicted. Uh, okay, so that's all from the supply side, but now let's talk about demand. So in demand, since we wanted to do everything pre-pandemic, we, we looked and we found this study from the CBO in 2006 that talked about a severe influenza pandemic, similar to that of the Spanish flu, and they predicted the shocks. So they predicted agriculture, construction, manufacturing would have around a 10% uh, decrease. And then you see transportation uh, having a sh large shock of 67%, Accommodation, arts, and recreation of 80%. Um, and then uh, healthcare actually a, a slight increase. That's something that didn't happen it, since it was just a very small sector of healthcare. Um, and then we can merge the supply shock and the demand shock. And we can see, for example, cooks, waiters, uh, they have a large supply shock because they're not considered essential and can't work, but they also have a strong demand shock because people don't want to go to restaurants. Airline pilots, uh, they're considered essential since it's transport, but people don't want to fly, so they also have a, a, a higher shock. And then other occupations have a different uh, shock, so office clerks, for example, they're sort of mixed and they're affected less. Okay, uh, and as we have this duality between industries and occupation, we can do the same thing. So these are now the shocks for the industries. We have a supply and demand shock. Uh, for the supply shock, we see, again, entertainment and restaurant, they're hit both, sorry, both on supply and demand. Transport is not hit by supply, but it's highly hit by demand. And then when it comes to manufacturing, uh, demand is low, but supply, it, it varies a lot depending on, on, on how the lockdown uh, happened. Okay, so can we do a quick, you know, these are just shocks, and I'm going to talk later on about second order effects. But just looking at the shocks, what are we talking about? H how much is the economic cost? So first we looked at employment, so people that cannot work. And I have to say, this does not translate into unemployment because there's furlough, and there's contracts and this other stuff. But we said 90% of people cannot work because of supply, 13% because of the demand. Of course, there's some people that are mixed in here, like cooks and restaurants that are hit by both. So in total, it's actually what we estimated is 23% of the people cannot work. Uh, and then we said, well, let's say, you know, those people, let's assume they, they wouldn't get their wage. Out of the total wages that are paid normally, how much wages wouldn't be paid? And that was a 16%. So notice it's quite lower than this 23. So this is already um, ringing a bell. And then we looked at the value added, right? We have industries and we can see how the shocks to different industries add up and that's a 20% in value added. Let me go a bit more into this employment and wage thing. We divided the population into quartiles, into wage quartiles. So the lowest quartile is what you'd say normally the poor, it's people that earn uh, below, tw that the wage is below 25% of all the wages. And top quartile is the rich people, their, their wage is higher than 75% of all the population. Now, what we see is that if you're in the lowest quartile, there's a 41% probability that you won't be able to work. And this is quite high when you compare it to if you're rich, there's only a 6% chance that you won't be able to, to work. Uh, and then we also looked at the total wage loss. So we said the 16%, but how is it divided? How much is in the lowest quartile? And that's a 31%. So we actually see out of all the quartals, even in wage, uh, in wage uh, quantity, it's bared by the poor. So this is what we have to think about safety nets and unemployment benefits because, well, this is happening. And just to put even another concerning picture out there, we, uh, here you have the labor shock. So you have cooks and restaurants be being uh, hardly hit um, and wage on the horizontal axis. And we color coded occupations by their exposure to infection. Uh, so this is how, in, how do they deal with, uh, how regular do they deal with the season infection. Uh, and what's surprising is that from the high wage occupations, airline pilots are basically the only ones that have a high labor shock. Uh, however, there's many low wage occupations that have a very high labor shock. And then if you look at the low wage occupations that have a low labor shock, they tend to be lightly colored. So you see janitors, maids and house cleaners. What this is basically saying is, okay, basically, if, if you tend to be in the lowest quartile, 
you either cannot work or if you're working, well, maybe you're being exposed to the virus uh, in higher doses. So this is also a bit worrying. Okay, but this was all about getting the shocks out there. But then, you know, okay, this, we had the study uh, mid-April, but you know, this pandemic is still ongoing. How can we take the second order effects and all the complicated things the economy is doing? So to do that, we need to incorporate the supply chain in a macroeconomic model. So here you can see nodes are uh, sectors of the economy. We see agriculture here at the top and final demand and consumption. Uh, and what you can think, for example, is let's say a shock hits manufacturing and electronic, they stop producing. Well, this might hit IT, for example. Of course, IT might also be hit by demand because people uh, want IT or less or more depending on, uh, on it. And we have a lot of propagation here. So to do this in follow-up work, we did a one dynamic model. So it's model in time steps. And this allows us to put uh, complicated rules. Uh, then we have a unique pr production function that distinguishes between critical and non-critical inputs. We consider both supply and demand shocks and there's important difference in how this behaves. We also had inventories and a consumption function that considers an epidemic impact. Uh, I'm going to go a bit into detail into this. So how does the dynamic look very broadly, but just very broadly, we have an initial steady state, we have a lockdown, and we have the first order shocks that start propagating. So we have, you know, uh, computers are not being built, so people cannot work in IT, for example, uh, or well, s something like that. And then, um, and then there's a post lockdown economy where you know people can work again, and supply shocks are removed, but consumption is still not removed entirely because well, we haven't gone back to normal yet, right? Like not everyone's going to restaurants. And uh, then finally, in a post pandemic world, the the consumption uh, demand uh, shocks are, are removed. So what about this critical inputs? Well, we asked some, well, some experts made some uh, survey and they asked, can, produ can production continue in industry X if input Y is not available for two months? And uh, this is what we call critical or not critical inputs and our, our production function considers this uh, for the model. Now there's a difference between demand and supply shocks, as I said. Uh, supply shocks disappear after lockdown. So here we see three sectors. Electricity is not hit. Paper manufacturing is hit on the supply side. But after lockdowns, they can go back to normal. Instead, restaurants, after lockdown, they decrease. But people are still wary of their virus. So this just goes down slowly. And this is a, a, also a consumption function that uh, depends on the epidemics, right? People are still wor uh, scared of the virus or worried about their income. And this affects uh, it. And it, it won't go to the end until we reach the the pandemic. The, until the pandemic ends, they, they won't go away. So this is also a, a thing our model allows us to do. Okay, so we did this and we predicted uh, through time, lockdown starts two months later, two months later we assume lockdown ended. Uh, what's the gross out for, for different industries? And on the black solid line is the aggregate, the aggregate of all the industries. So for the first quartile, uh, if you compare 2020 with 2019, we predicted a 21% decrease in GDP. Uh, we're talking that most forecasts were around 16%. Actually, Bank of England was more pessimistic. They assumed a 30% a, a, um, a decrease. Uh, it turns out that when the data came, this was 22%. And of course, our, our, our forecasts were done before the data came. Uh, so this was actually quite a nice result. We were quite happy with this. We looked a bit more into, in, into how things worked. We, we um, compared to the Washington data, so here it's unemployment, uh, people that filed for unemployment and what our model would predict. And these are different sectors of the economy. And we see that we have, we have errors for sure, but in general, they seem to have averaged out on the aggregate in such a way that we, we managed to do a, a decent prediction. Uh, one very interesting thing about our model is that when you look about how the economy interacts, there can be coordination failures in the supply chain. So we played and you know, just put demand shocks and then only put supply shocks and then put both. And something really interesting was that apparently it's worse only to put supply shocks and not demand and supply. And we're really curious about this. And what happens is that sometimes when, you, when people keep on buying stuff, they and inventories are running out for those industries uh, whose production is compromised because of the lockdown. As people start buying some of those critical inputs, other industries cannot work, and we have this bottleneck. So I don't know. Perhaps you could think of IT, 
they, they need computers and other special equipment. But then people at home, they start needing uh, more of this stuff because they're working remotely. They start buying some of this uh, essential stuff. And then IT can no longer work. And because IT can no longer work, then other industries can no longer work. Uh, and this is something we need to look uh, more into. But it, it, it's something, um, it's a new result. And it's something we believe is intrinsic for a model that acknowledges how complex the economy is. Uh, finally, let's talk a bit about economics and epidemiology. We know they're, they're coupled, right? Uh, the virus is spread by people and the economy is run by people. So we, we did some very basic epidemiology and this is something we're, we're working to refine and, and do it better uh, with uh, more uh, detailed uh, epidemic analysis. But just on a, on, a, on a brief basis, we consider different scenarios. So a lockdown or a pre-lockdown uh, manufacturing and and then different opening let's say manufacturing open all except consumer facing etc cetera, etc cetera. so blue bars are the increase in gdp of course even if you open everything because there was the lockdown uh then you you you, you won't recover to anything but you'll recover most of it and we uh split the r0 so re reproduction number you know if it's above one uh this is where basically we start to get worried because one people transmits it to more than one person. So we have exponential growth. And what we see is um, we, we, we divided this number into consumption, transport, school, and work. And we also uh, took uh, work. We consider work in which industry they worked. And we had data on how exposed to other people they could be. So that we disaggregated this even further. And we actually found that uh, maybe there's, a, uh, there's some compromise when it comes to supply shocks on uh, all except consumer facing, right? Now, um, this is something we need to be careful about because as we say, the supply shocks are removed with the lockdown, the demand shocks are not removed. So you still see a huge drop. And this is because un unless the, the, ep the epidemic is, is, is over, we're still gonna, we're not gonna return to a back to normal. We might never even return to a back to normal, but people are not gonna spend as much in restaurants and pubs and in barbers and other stuff if, if we still have an epidemic ongoing. Uh, so just with that, I'll, I'll conclude and leave to Doin. Um, the economic costs are distributed differently among income classes. We see they, they bear a uh, higher cost on the poor. Uh, our, our shocks um, can be used to initialize macroeconomic model. So this is something they're out there. We're very happy if you use our model, but if, if you have another model, please go ahead. Uh, we have second order effects that are complex. We, we observe this coordination failure in the supply chain. And you know, further work, we have to learn how to live with the virus. We have to find a sweet spot between having the economy open, but also mitigating the pandemic. And there's gonna be a, ha a hammer and dance. So just with that, I'd like to say thank you. I think it's month seven of the pandemic. So I hope you're holding in there and sending everyone a remote hug. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Okay. Yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Doreen. Thank you. Well, I think you did a great job. And so I think let's just take questions from the audience. Um, great. So uh, just before we get on to the questions from the audience, um, I have a few myself. The first is, did you do much analysis of the impact by different age groups or age cohorts? Uh, of the employment income and other effects? Because a lot of what I'm picking up is that it's highly variable. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess short answer is no. We did it first on just yeah. part health of income, but yeah. uh, it's, it's one of the things we're looking forward to do. And also, that's also very important when you look at epidemics as well. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and vulnerabilities. And I think it will be as we go back. The other question is, did you discern um, differences between country strategies? I mean, would this look very different in Germany to the UK to the US? Um, and I guess in the US, the obvious experiment is between different states uh, who have adopted very different strategies uh, in the way they've managed this. Yeah, maybe uh, I can take that one. Um, you know, we, we debated which country to, de to do. We had the best information about uh, shocks for the U.S., so we had to use an Italian list of essential industries, and uh, you know we lived in the U.K. So we initially said, okay, we'll do it for the U.S. because we had more detailed information. 
problem in the U.S., as you mentioned, Ian, is there's actually 50 different policies going on for the pandemic, and the economy is all out of sync, and the data collection is terrible, and basically there's a massive headache of the, the fact that we don't have good data for any one country, so the model had to be a bit of a pastiche of information we took from different countries and then modified as needed. And um, so you, do you feel that the results are mainly applicable for the UK or do you think they're generali no, generalizable? The, the results are quite general. And if we had more more person power, we, w we could have done most of the countries in the world. We've set up the model now so it uses something called the World Input Output Database, which covers about 85 or 90 percent of GDP and covers maybe at this point 50 countries. So we can really we could do all of those countries. That would have that would make the model for the UK more accurate because then we'd be modeling the rest of the world rather than right now we have to take the rest of the world as an exogenous input and there's inaccuracy induced there. It's just more work. And you know, we, we basically did this whole modeling effort without any official support, uh, just sort of grabbing people off of whatever they were doing in a press gang style and uh, working very intensely. Um, you know, I think I'm quite proud of the fact that we did it as quickly as we did, and we recommended a policy that wasn't too far away from what was enacted, and we came out with predictions that were pretty much spot on for what's happened since then. And I, I guess a related question is these trade-offs between short and medium term. Uh, so it might be that short-term pain, I mean, that's certainly the argument about short-term pain, is that you you have short-term pain and medium-term gain, and that's what strategies in places like uh, China, South Korea, uh, Japan, um, Taiwan, Mongolia, Vietnam would seem to vindicate. You, you know, so is, I guess you you don't really have that temporal dimension, so it's difficult for you to say anything about that. No, actually, we we do have the temporal dimension, and. We also, I mean, Maria didn't say too much about it, but we built an epidemiological model. Now, to answer the question that you're raising, we you have to couple the epidemiological model to the economic model, as we did, but you have to have a good enough epidemiological model that you believe the results. And we, we found, <clears throat> we weren't totally pleased with anybody's epidemiological model, including our own. Um, you know, that's not, necessarily the fault of the epidemiologist, this is a unique virus, and then it transmits both through the air and through droplets. And so if the transmission mechanisms are different than what people are focused on, you've got TB on one side, which is like the airborne small particles that you know we're so worried about being in room with people about. And then there's the, the droplets that don't go more than two meters. And you know as long as somebody doesn't spit on you, you're okay. Um, so so, okay, so that was a tough problem. Now, let me just mention another thing that we found. I think our model is very good at short-term economic effects because we're modeling all these mechanical effects like running out of inventories and the, the flow of goods across sectors in time that other models don't do. So I think short-term our model's pretty good. Long-term, it's harder because long-term stuff depends on things like people's expectations. How is the pandemic going to affect everybody's savings rate? And what are they gonna do when it lifts? Are they gonna spend all the money that they save? It, which has to do with their expectations about the future because they might be unemployed and their expectation about getting another job is gonna determine how much they're gonna hoard their pennies. And so there's a lot of their longer term you have questions that really depend on the way people think. And those are always the harder things to model. Um, so it's a big challenge to get this right over the long term and to really understand these rebound effects properly. Just to add on to that, one, one important thing about uh, the virus is that it's exponential growth. So when you talk short term, medium term, the thing is the closer you get it to the initial condition, to the initial outbreak, the better it's going to be. Well, when you're in an in, in economy, it you know the lockdown doesn't really matter when you put it. So that that should give you enough of an idea of the trade-off of you should start the lockdown early on. Well, the thing that's really uh, interesting about our model is that it's based on data on work, on how people work and how people interact. 
And since, you know, people working are the basis of the economy in a way, that, that can tell us how it is affected, but people working and interacting also tells us how the virus spreads. So we, if we nail that one thing along with, you know, everything else in the very complex economy, uh, then we have a pretty good shot. So I think uh, the fact that we have a dynamic model with time steps where, where we can do everything, we're out of equilibrium, it just gives a unique advantage that we really hope to exploit. And do you feel that from all of that, you have some advice that, you know, we're, do you feel a position that you could say something to the UK government or any government about strategy on the result of your model? Well, we did. We actually sprinted to make them aware of it. And, uh, you know, one of our main messages, as Maria said at the end, is that some industries can be opened with relatively little epidemiological pain and play a profound role in the economy. In fact, it's essential that the upstream industries, the, the industries that supply stuff so other industries can make things, those need to get open because otherwise the economy hits bottlenecks and things could actually be worse than um, opening, how to put this, closing downstream industries doesn't help if you don't open up the upstream industries. So we really, we could say very fairly specific things about that and and we gave rather strong advice on that point. Okay, well, I've, I've got more questions, but I see there's six in the box. So let's, um, let's turn to those. Um, and Pete, I see people haven't voted as far as I can see. Well, there's one vote, three votes. So let's start with the three vote question. Um, okay, that's a technical question. What programming language did you use to create the model? And do you believe open source models are better than commercial models? Of course. By the way, this is being recorded, so um, I guess, uh, you know, just be aware it's being recorded. If you're not comfortable with it being recorded, then you shouldn't ask questions, I suppose. <laughs> sure. Uh, no, so it's, uh, we did a mix. Most of the first analysis is done in Python. The second one is done in R. Uh, we have everything online. So if, if you click on, well, we, we can distribute it on the second paper. It's an interactive, so you can actually play with the model and put your own scenarios and see, you know, what's our epidemiological model, what's the R zero, and what's the consequences. Uh, and it's all open source. It's all in GitHub. All our all our shocks out out there. And uh, uh, yeah, we're we're just big on open source and having uh, things as clear as they can be. And yeah, you could live in that. For sure. Admirable. Okay, uh, this has got three votes. What are the policy implications of these findings in terms of redistributive options to protect welfare and demand? From Anna McCrod and three other supporters. So wait, to, to protect what? You're talking well, about how well, to, protect to protect welfare and demand. Welfare and demand. So I think, as Maria stressed in her talk, one of the things we see is that policies, if, if we just let things roll, the poor bear the brunt of the pandemic and they bear it on both sides. They're most li more likely to get sick. I think that's pretty clear from the data so far. And they're much more likely to be unemployed. And they're actually paying a lion's share, even in absolute terms, in terms of lost wages. So, so our model makes that very clear. And so if we want to fight against that, we have to have policies that overturn that. Uh, you know, I think economists are in pretty broad agreement about this, that you really need policies that protect people, protect displaced people, and in particular, protect poor people. You know, it's ultimately good for them, but it's also good for GDP in general, because if you lose a lot of people from the economy, you're in danger of not getting them back. And one of the lessons that was learned during the Great Depression is that, uh, you know, it's a, a Keynesian feedback loop. If once you have a lot of people unemployed, that means those people aren't demanding goods, they aren't buying things, which means that people have no incentive to produce them, which means that people stay unemployed and you can get stuck in that loop for decades. And so it's essential that we do things to jolt the economy back out of that loop. And Maria, did you want to add some, something? Uh, I mean, I just uh, want to add on that feedback, Luke. We also have the more you protect the people, the more people are okay staying at home. 
uh, you, you see huge uh, problems in developed countries where you have informal labor and where governments didn't implement uh, the safety nets, where people keep on working, people keep going out. So all, all in all, we need to protect those people because they're losing their income, be, because if not, they're exposed to the virus. But And as, as Doin said, e even from a GDP scenario, we don't want to lose them or you get those feedback loops about the, the ones we got in the Great Repression. But even when it comes to the epidemiology, you want to pay people to stay at home. I think I think that's that's one of the other things we have to emphasize that the um, yeah that that we have to support people uh, for being at home as well. Okay, um, this one's got two votes. I noticed in the journal paper that the demand in the healthcare sector was up fifteen percent in the U.S. Uh, I've, um, read and heard talks that the healthcare demand in the US has decreased by 30%, um, not least because of coronavirus and healthcare facilities, and that telehealth has not compensated for this. What's the discrepancy between your increased demand and those that argue it's actually gone down? And I've also seen um, demand, and I suppose part of the answer is it depends how you define healthcare, but let's hear what you're yeah. saying. So that's, that's certainly one of the things we didn't get right. Um, we didn't anticipate that in the U.S., with the peculiarity of the U.S., I think, uh, you know, the, the uh, normal kinds of healthcare things, procedures were largely postponed. Uh, they wanted to reserve the capacity for the hospitals for COVID patients. They didn't want people coming in and getting exposed to COVID in the hospital. Uh, so in fact, the sign was flipped from what we would have thought based on, because uh, we just assumed that, that the normal stuff would go on. So that's been an effect that I think played out to different levels in different countries and that we didn't properly anticipate. And just to add on to that, in the appendix E, I believe of the paper, we have a, like, a, a more detailed response on what the, the things actually were. And yeah, the thing is, the way we wanted to do this is, Everything was with things pre-pandemic, right? And the CBO study was the one we found available that had those predictions. And yeah, I think, as Doreen said, that's, that's one of the things we need to improve on. Yeah, and CDO does need to revise their work. Um, <laughs> okay, thinking back to one of the last slides about the impact of opening different sectors of the economy. Do you know why opening school increases are so much and what is the impact of having schools open or closed on the economy? from Pippa. Um, maybe, yeah, okay. So schools, you know, obviously very important issue. Uh, it, the, there's a lot of devils in the details of that question because we had to make some assumptions about how schools work and now, and, and part of the whole problem is that people are adapting their behavior all the time. So as people find new ways of doing things, then, um, then things change. I'm in New York, actually, at the moment. My son is enrolled in a school, a private school here in New York, Greek school. And, um, and they've organized things so that kids are in small pods. So they're pods of five students. And he's really only interacting in a way that can infect other people with those five students. So that if there's a case, they can shut that pod down and still keep the rest of the school going measures like that are going to have a fairly dramatic effect on how much R0 is affected by opening and closing schools. I think we're also seeing a question of priorities. Of course, if schools are closed, then a lot of people can't go to work because they need daycare. So uh, it's important. I don't think that came through properly in our paper that schools gate a lot of other things. So they really are quite a high priority to keep open both because kids need school, but also because it has a dramatic effect on the rest of the labor force. Um, okay, I, I guess Maria, Maria just... She, she needs to reconnect, so um, we'll come back to that if, if she has anything okay. more to say. Uh, this is a, a question that got four votes. Um, it has been pointed out that high earning population groups with the ability to work remotely have ended up with more disposable income. Uh, and that's part because they're spending less on food and transport and so on. Um, 
And so have savings rates for these people been higher over the last six months than would otherwise have been? And would you expect that to be translated into a splurge on non-essential luxury goods post lockdown? And how, um, how are these excess savings going to be consumed and what impact will that have? And that's from Alex Clark. Yeah, so good set of questions. We wrestled hard with those questions. Uh, indeed, the model predicts and we has observed that, that there is more savings for high affluence groups during the pandemic. And uh, I think there's also some evidence of some splurging as it ends. Although one of the things that we, uh, you know, didn't quite know how to deal with and that you see going on in our model is that uh, we just assumed a complete unlockdown past some certain point. Um, and whereas, you know, we're, that's ambiguous at this point, how long the pandemic's going to last and when are we really going to see this splurge? I think it's probably spread out over a longer period of time than our model would anticipate. There's also, you know, again, it also depends on people's long-term view of the economy. If people are going, gosh, we could have another Great Depression, things could be bad for a long time, then they're more likely to hang on to those savings and not pump them back in. So there's a trade-off there that, um, you know, our model predicts some splurred spending, but, but not unrestricted because people are still worried that this could go on forever. And even if the pandemic ends, the economic pain could last a long time. Scholars of the Great Depression are well aware of that. Yep. Um, so don't go out and buy any uh, stocks in luxury brands just yet. Um, uh, how much uncertainty is there in the amount different occupations or sectors contribute to transmission? And did this uncertainty propagate through into your recommendations from Chris W? So let me make sure how, un, how much uncertainty when you say transmission, does transmission, you mean economic transmission or epidemiological transmission? Um, Chris doesn't oh. make that clear. So okay, you, so I'll try and answer both the, questions. Yeah, absolutely. Try and answer both questions. Um, economic transit transmission. Well, there's always uncertainty. Hey, it's an economic model, and we're not talking uh, celestial mechanics here. Um, so there's always uncertainty in these things. But I think you know you can see the amount of pain. You can certainly see what happened. If you reduce the flow by a certain amount, this actually gets back to the question about production functions, which maybe I would have emphasized a little more than Maria did. There's two questions. One is, okay, who can work? But the other question is, how much will they produce given that we have certain groups working and others not working? How much will that affect how much they produce? And so you get thrust back to one of the nasty problem, you know, fundamental problems in economics of the production function. If you have a certain set of inputs, how much will you produce? And what you can see is that our model is very sensitive to the assumptions that are made about the production function and that people are making models with different versions of production functions as if those production functions were handed by God and were the truth. There's a lot of uncertainty in, and, and I think none of the production functions do a really good job of saying what's happening. I think this is one of the advantages of our model. We, because we did a survey among industry experts about what mattered, I think we have a better production function than others. And I think that's one of the reasons we made good predictions. Um, so there's uncertainty on the economic side, particularly in the production function. Now on the epidemiological side, there's huge uncertainty because in order to make a model of what the epidemiological consequence of a particular industry being retired or, or being at low output and people not going to work, um, or, or really to say it better, the epidemiological consequences of sending them back to work, you have to make, you have to have a reasonable model about how much people are going to infect each other when they go back to work. And that really depends on a lot of details about the workplace and a lot of details about the way the 
COVID-19 viruses transmitted that are unknown. So we had to do our best to make guesses about those things. We were helped by, you know, a remarkable um, database in the U.S. that does give a lot of information like average proximity of workers in the workplace and even has information about likelihood of exposure to infection, though that's typically assuming that they're working with sick people. And so we made some guesses at that, and but there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't have good models for those things. So I think that's the biggest uncertainty in the model that we made. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Aninka. Uh, do you think the res results, and you sort of answered this already, uh, we got Maria back, which is good. Uh, do you think your, your results are reliable only um, in the UK? Yeah, I mean, as we said, we, we made the UK as our target so we could have some numbers to put in. We could have done this for any country. And, and if we'd had more person power, we could have done it for 50 countries and that would have been certainly better and more informative. It would have been interesting because then we could have done as each country, as the, as the pandemic swept around the world, because you recall it went from China to Europe, to America, to South America and so on. As it swept around the world, we would have been able to see better how the different parts of the economy were asynchronously causing supply and demand bottlenecks and it would have been a very interesting thing to do if we had had the person power to do that. Yeah. Uh, just, just to add on to that, uh, the shocks, we have them for the US and we have them for the UK at the wide level. And depending on my man, uh, how we might be uh, increasing to Italy and, and uh, Germany and Spain where we have other essential industries. But if, if you're planning to use their that are interested in just email us and we try and see what we can do. But at, at least um, for the UK and the US, uh, the shocks are there and people can use them. Great, Maria. Um, did you want to come back on any of the previous questions? When uh, you were, I don't know what happened, but disconnected. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, but my computer froze. So actually I wasn't able to hear the questions. Okay, but, um, so I they, might, they might be up there in the, if you go to the answered section of the ask a question, oh, I see. you'll see okay. them, yeah. Okay, um, so a couple more questions that are come in. Uh, well, while you look at that, I'll just pose these other questions because we're beginning to, to come close to time. Um, how would you score the US and UK in terms of acting in line with your conclusions to date? From last huh. line. <laughs> well, the US and the UK get lousy scores in, in, because it's really the epidemiological side. Well. The epidemiological side has just been poorly managed in both countries. In both cases, the response should have been aggressive early on, and the emphasis should have been on contact tracing and testing at scale. And had we implemented massive uh, efforts in both of those early on, we could have averted a huge economic hit. So the amount of money we would have spent to do that would have been, you know, saved by factors of 100 or something on the other side. Now, our model doesn't explicitly go into that because we don't have a model of how contract tracing would have worked and we weren't focused on the, uh, you know, what if scenario of, of saying that. Now, th that said, economically, the UK did implement some pretty sensible policies that helped blunt the force of the epidemic, like furloughing and basically trying to keep workers in place so that we wouldn't have to totally reconstruct the economy once the lockdown's over. And so I think the UK did reasonably well there. In the UK, you know, there were massive unemployment, there was massive unemployment, but there has been an economic stimulus, though that economic stimulus is not as much as our model would say would be required to get a better result. So Sorry. I give them both four scores, but the UK did a bit better economically. Here's a question from Lillian Martin. Um, what is the most important or surprising thing you've learned from the model so far? Good question, Lillian. Um, well, the bottleneck effects that Maria mentions surprised us. At some point, she showed you something that was very counterintuitive, 
that if you have only demand shocks, you get a certain amount of economic pain. If you have supply shocks only, you get a certain amount of economic pain. And that's actually worse than supply shocks and demand shocks. I didn't get those backwards. And that's because of these peculiar bottleneck effects where if you haven't carefully sorted out the way you're rationing intermediate goods as they shut down in the economy, industries that are really important may not have the inputs they need to produce what they need. And so you get a bottleneck that partially shuts the economy down. And we've never heard of other models showing such effects. Our model is unique in that we're modeling both and we're modeling them dynamically through time. And um, so I think this was the most surprising thing that happened in our model. Rhea, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I agree that's it. I guess uh, we must highlight that, you know, if the economy is ever out of equilibrium, it's in a pandemic, right? Like toilet paper ran out, people wanted to work, they couldn't work. There were so many complex dynamics and economic models are, well, most of them have not been out of equilibrium. And the fact that uh, just creating an out of equilibrium model, we found this stuff, it makes me wonder how many things there are out there in the economy that we have not seen because we have not explored out of equilibrium models, right? It seems to me like, you know, one of the things this pandemic tells us is, okay, we have to do safety nets, we have to manage the pandemic, but we also need uh, better economic tools. If more people had been doing this, maybe we would have been better prepared. Uh, so I think, I, I think you know that when you said that was one of the unexpected things. I'll go back to a quick question. Someone said, um, if, if we have Alex Clark, would you expect a splurge of non-essential luxury goods post-pandemic lockdown? Uh, in the paper, we have one revision with some demand shocks that they say they postpone it. So some things don't work like that. Haircut, you know, you, you don't get three haircuts after the pandemic, uh, but cars might be that way. So there's, there's certain some things you have to take into account. But I'm mostly concerned that our demand consumption will change for the longer term. I'm not sure we're going uh, to a back normal. So I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah. Okay, well, that Thanks. relates to another question, which is, what contribution can a green stimulus package make to the recovery? Yeah, well, and it's a great opportunity to um, pump money into, because the economy needs to be stimulated. We're facing climate change, which is an even bigger problem than the COVID pandemic and a much more sustained problem. So it's a perfect chance to uh, stimulate the economy by stimulating industries that will help us deal with climate change. Now, that said, I think it's important just to stimulate the economy so we shouldn't, uh, you know, it's, it's not the time to be doing things that might hurt the economy in the long run, but, or, or the short run. Um, but, you know, I have another paper that's under review at the moment where we're arguing that, uh, massive jump in renewables is actually going to make energy cheaper and that in fact even if there weren't climate change we should be massively going into solar and wind because they're going to make energy cheaper and they're going to save us money and so why not step on the gas now with covid and pump stimulus into making that happen okay let's take two final questions and then um and then i'll i'll sum up uh well, not sum up but that end uh, can a loss of GDP in 2021 eventually play out as another loss of demand with a lag effect later in 2025 or 2027 or later? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, I would say we haven't really addressed that. I, I don't think we're seeing... So, and let me make sure I understand the question. So the question is, are we are we going to see long term GDP effects in 2025? Yeah, Is I guess lag, maybe question? lagged effects in investment and savings and so on. Lagged effects in investment and savings. So this kind yeah. of goes back to what I was saying before, which is that you have to look at people's expectations over the long term. And there is a danger of a feedback loop. Part of the Keynesian feedback loop is that once the economy gets depressed, people expect a depressed economy and so they depress their investments, and so we stay depressed. And so we definitely need to worry about that very persistent effect happening 
and pump stimulus in to break us out of that loop. So, um, so yeah, I think okay. that's a big worry. Um, final question. Uh, how does the emergence of a second wave disrupt the economy? And do you have a sense of the magnitude of the economic shock that a second wave uh, could provoke from your modeling work? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on how big the second wave is. If, if the second wave is bigger, bigger than the first wave, it's going to have a similarly large economic shock unless people decide to handle things differently. I think during the course of time, we've now had a lot of debate about priorities. And um, so, you know, there's a Swedish approach of let a few pe extra people die and keep the economy going. And there is a Danish approach that let's be very safe. And one of the things we saw is when we compared Denmark and Sweden, uh, both took a big economic hit. It was only slightly worse for Denmark and Sweden. And Denmark took a substantially smaller uh, pandemic hit. So I think it really depends on those trade-offs we make, because in a second wave, we may make the trade-offs a bit differently. I also think in a second wave, we're learning how to adapt. I mean, one of the totally idiotic things that the British government did was they did not have people start wearing masks early on in the pandemic. I mean, it's a no-brainer. I'm in New York. Everybody wears a mask here. They've been doing it for a long time. Crazy, right? So, so now people will be wearing masks more and we'll have a more sensible policy. So we may be able to function economically at a better level while keeping more industries going because we're just making obvious uh, epidemiological adaptation. We, we're learning as we as we go. Hopefully we're learning. Not everyone's learning, um, <laughs> unfortunately. One wonders about <laughs> Boris. Is he learning anything? Well, they're not the only one. <laughs> um, <laughs> if only he was. Um, yeah. Thanks so much to Maria and to Doan and to everyone that's joined in, not least Lillian. It's wonderful that, that you won, Lillian. Uh, has been so involved in the Oxford Martin School from before its inception, uh, actually, in 2006. Um, the Oxford Martin School is devoted to thinking about the big challenges of the future and bringing great minds together, uh, thinking about interdisciplinary teams and drawing on different disciplines. And I think the pandemic has really highlighted all of this. There can be no bigger issue for us to focus on at the moment. Uh, it absolutely requires people to draw on different disciplines, not least uh, the medical and epidemiological, but also social sciences and not and economics. And I think in Maria and Don, uh, we've seen, seen a wonderful example of how uh, this can be brought together, uh, providing some answers and, of course, many more questions, uh, which is what always happens with great thinking. Um, tomorrow, there's a talk on COVID in Africa uh, at the, that the Oxford Martin School is hosting. And then uh, next week, uh, on the 13th of October at 5 p.m., Mariano uh, Masicato is talking about the big failure of small government, COVID-19, and public sector capacity, also as part of the series on Oxrep. And I'm, I'm sure that um, Cameron will be back uh, for that. So to all of you, thank you for connecting on whatever time zone you're on. Um, the one benefit of the pandemic has been that we have a wider global audience uh, than that that we get in the lecture theatre at times, although that too can be connected to remotely. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to Doan and uh, Marie particularly. Uh, stay safe, stay well, uh, and stay engaged. Goodbye to all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.